Amen. All right. If you are able to find a Bible, we've got some here in the book racks and, and chairs in front of you. If you wouldn't mind turning to the book of Habakkuk. <laughs> 806. Um, I've heard it pronounced so many different ways this week that I'm like, huh, maybe we need to change it up. Uh, and, and before the series, I was looking at all the different options of how to pronounce it, and it is debated because it's an it's a, uh, interesting word that they just you know, didn't have a definitive, this is how you say it. Um, so I thought Habakkuk, because we're from the Midwest, like back, uh, and we have that nasally A. Uh, but if I hear it the other way enough times, I'm just going to switch. Um, so just heads up there. We're on page 806, and I'm going to read the text, and we'll get to work. One more thing before we jump in. Uh, I messed up this week. Um, <clears throat> every week when I'm doing sermon prep, I'm uh, doing some different things. I'm online on some different websites, and I switch versions to look at how, it, how it's worded in different versions. And I switched over to a, a version called the English Standard Version of Translation. And then I copied and pasted that and sent it off to the team. Uh, we use the NIV around here. The Bibles that you maybe have on your lap is an NIV. And so some of the things that I say and that maybe we even put up on the screen, they might not perfectly line up. So good luck today, um, but I, I believe in you and I uh, think we can do this. But let's read the text, we'll pray, and then we'll get to work. This is Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 to 17. It reads like this. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am doing... I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gap gallops headlong, their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. By building up earthen ramps, they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their god. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no rulers. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hook. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Let's pray. As we've opened your word together, we're praying that you, by your spirit, through that word, would speak to us today. Help us to know who you are and what you're up to and how we can live by faith in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's interesting. We actually, uh, I was planning to preach this book of the Bible several months ago, um, studying it and preparing to do it, and then I for a variety of reasons, as I was praying about it, I decided to park it for a little bit and then decided recently to bring it back out. Now, I, I bring this up because I, I wonder if the timing is God's timing and it's more appropriate now than it could have been several months ago. This week, as I was kind of just processing all that's happening with our church, there is a lot going on. There are people who are struggling with the loss of job and income and financial uncertainty. There are a bunch of people who are dealing with health concerns right now and just the uncertainty of um, what's going on in their physical bodies. We've got a bunch of people who are going through that right now. We've got interpersonal stuff that's just ugly. Uh, 
within the church and without the church. Um, there, there are family dynamics and family relationships that are, that are strained uh, more than some of us can even imagine. And so I was, th- I was actually up a few times in the night this week and just praying over you guys. And I, and, it, and I was grateful that God had given us this book and given us the opportunity to, to walk through it together. And my prayer has been that this would be helpful for you. As I think through all the brokenness that's going on, I'm not trying to be flippant about it. I hope that Habakkuk is actually a trustworthy guide and he's, he's leading us well and helping us well. And, and, and my prayer is that, that you would personally feel like God cares for you. And just, I just wanted to say that out loud as we got started today. Well, let's look at this then under three headings, what the Lord says in verses 5 to 11, how it feels, because so I think we get that answer in the response of the prophet, how it feels, and then finally, what, what does it mean? So what the Lord says in verses 5 to 11, first off, he doesn't disagree. Habakkuk has asked two big questions. He's looking at the, the brokenness of the world. He's looking at the the personal pain that he's going through, the violence that he sees, the injustice among the people of God. And he says, why? God, I, I, I don't understand why you allow these kinds of things to happen. I just don't get it. So why? And then secondly, he's like, also, if you're doing something about it, which I'm not certain of, how long is this going to take? If you gave me a timeline, I might be able to kind of sit sit tight for a little bit, but I'm just not clear of when you're going to do something, if you're going to do something. So he's asking these questions and he's raising these concerns. God, I don't get why there is so much violence, why, why people are turning away from your law. The law is paralyzed because people aren't following it and everything's a mess right now. And what are you doing? And then God responds and we get his response here in verses five and following. He doesn't disagree. He doesn't go, Habakkuk, uh, hold your horses here. You missed some information. You don't know everything, so let me just correct you here. You're kind of misreporting on the details. No, he doesn't correct them at all. He doesn't say, uh, hey, you got, this, you got this one all wrong. In some ways, he responds to him in a way that affirms his evaluation. Habakkuk is right that there is violence and injustice, and the people of God are not behaving as they should. And the absence of, of what he perceives to be God's activity is also not wrong. So he's, a, he's affirming the prophet in many ways in his response. And what he says is, I invite you to look again. Uh, Look at verse five. It says, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. Because back, you're, you're over here in your little corner of the world looking at your people, but I'm inviting you to open your eyes and look to the horizon and see what I'm up to. And this is amazing. Be astounded by my work. You, you are too narrowly focused. I want you to see my, my, um, my comprehensive plan for this world. I am, at, I am at work among the nation. I am doing something for all the peoples of the earth. You can only imagine what's going on with your people and why that's broken and not working, but I want you to see I've got a bigger and grander plan than you can even imagine. And in fact, it says, and you're not going to understand it. I'm going to tell you something, and it's going to be incomprehensible to you. I'm going to show you what I'm doing, and I'm going to explain it to you, and you're not going to get it. He says, verse 5, For I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Even if I explained it to you, you're you're not going to get it. He says, I'm doing a work, which is that he is telling him, Hey, look, I know you think I'm inactive right now, but I'm at work in your days. I'm doing stuff right now. It's the... The, the hidden providence of God. And sometimes we look at our lives and we go, I don't, I don't get it. What is God up to? He is at work and we just can't discern it. He, his, his, what he's doing doesn't always make sense to us. We always look at us, at our circumstances, at what we want God to do. If he's not doing those things, we think, well, he's dropping the ball here. He's not doing his job here. But Isaiah tells us, another prophet tells us, God's ways are not our way. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He, he is different from us. So what we consider to be the right course of action isn't always what God is up to because he knows better than we do. So he says, I'm going to explain this to you and you're not going to believe it. You're not going to be able to comprehend what I'm doing. I'm doing a work, but you're not going to believe it even if I tell you. Um, Those of you that have kids, you understand how this works. If you've got young kids, especially, you say to them, "Uh, here's what I need you to do. And they say, why? And you go, 
because my and my kids watch a program called Bluey. So if you don't watch that, you should. Um, it's about a, a family of dogs, and the parents are awesome. And um, I, I could sit down by myself and binge watch Bluey. That's how good it is. Uh, I could watch it without my kids, and I would have a lot of fun. But on Bluey, they, they always say, so if the parent says, hey, I want you to do this, and the kids say, uh, why? And the parent says, because. They say, that's not a reason, right? They want to know, okay, tell me uh, what the reason is. And oftentimes as parents, we do try to explain things. We say, okay, here's why I want you to not dive headfirst into a swimming pool. Like, here's why I want you to not have a third helping of ice cream. You know, here, here's the why. And we explain it, but there are also times where we say, because, and they say, well, that's not a reason. Then you, then you pull out the big card, uh, because I say so, right? Like some of you parents are very familiar with that uh, parenting hack. And you just say, I'm just telling you what you have to do here, because I say so. But God says, I'm going to explain something to you here, and it's going to feel incomprehensible to you. I'm doing something. It is amazing. It is astounding. You can look at it. You can behold it. You, you will be uh, astounded by it. But, but w- even when I explain what I'm doing, you're not going to fully grasp it. You're, you're just going to have to trust God. And, um, and that will be enough. You're, you would not believe it even if you were told this. And then he explains what he's doing. Here it comes, verse, verse 6. He says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. That's the ESV version. It's Babylonians in the NIV that you've got in your lap. But he says, I am raising up an enemy army, that bitter and hasty nation. Okay, I'm doing something. It's on the, it's on the scale of the nations. You can look at it and behold it and wonder at it in amazement. I'm going to do this, and you're not going to get it. Okay, I'm going to tell you anyways. And he says, here's what I'm doing. I'm raising up the Babylonians. And Habakkuk says, wait, 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 I don't get it. He says, yeah, I know. That's what I told you. You don't get it. He says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, this bitter and hasty nation. Now, God is fully aware of the character of this nation, which is what he, what he does in verses 7 to 11. He outlines, I'm aware. I know who they are. It wasn't like I, I recruited them, but we didn't really do the background check, so I don't, I'm not sure who they are. He says, no, I've been there before. I know what they're like. Let me explain it to you. I'm fully aware that they are awful and proud about it. Verse 7, they are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. They're, they're this uh, impetuous people, this awful people, this bitter and hasty nation that is, that's performing evil. And it's ironic because Habakkuk was saying, hey, you've got some evil over here, gosh, or why you're allowing it. Uh, and, and the law is paralyzed because people don't want to follow it. He's looking at his people going, this is our problem. And God says, yeah, I'm going to bring the, the Babylonians, and they're an evil people, and they're a law unto themselves. They just do whatever they want. They don't follow the ways of God at all. And he says, I'm going to bring them, and their justice and their dignity go forth from themselves, They are violent and determined. Verse 9, they all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. They're this awful army that's going to invade, and they are set and determined to do violence. They're gathering up captives. They're mocking and scoffing in their hubris, in their pride. Look at verse 10. It says, at kings, they scoff. At rulers, they laugh. They let at every fortress, for they pile up earth and they take it. They're this proud, powerful nation bent on evil, but anything that stands in their way, they're going to bulldoze it. Any people, and in fact, if you look at, at, at history, you see the, the rise of the Babylonians, and you see that in this short span of 20 years, they went from virtually nobodies to being this world domination, this world power, and they did it through their pride, their violence, and their hubris. They, they scoff at these other rulers. All, all the while, they're also committing idolatry. Look at verse 11. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. God's not their God. He's saying they're, they're not mine. They're, they're not re- reflecting me. They're not worshiping me. They're not serving me with that sort of covenant commitment. Their, their God is their strength. So God is saying, I'm doing something here. I'm bringing the Babylonians, and I know who they are. 
He's fully aware of how awful they are. And so Habakkuk rightly says, I don't get it. What, what are you doing, God? So secondly, we see how it feels. We see this in, in uh, the following verses in the response of Habakkuk as he gives us, as if you look at the NIV, he gives a complaint. He says, wait, 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 wait. What are we doing here? Because this doesn't add up. So it's bewildering. In fact, uh, one of the commentators said, the cure of the Babylonian invasion is worse than the illness of the Judean sin. The, the cure of the Babylonian invasion is worse than the illness of the Jude- Judean sin. It's like when your kid is sick and you've got some medicine and you're like, okay, you got to drink this. And they're like, I think I'll take my chances, right? Like, I don't want this. I don't want this uh, medicine that you have. That's what Habakkuk is saying. It's like, I think we'll take our chances. I don't, I don't like this plan. And he, he puts it like this in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting? Oh, Lord, my God, my holy one. It's a rhetorical question. And all of the commentators point this out, but only a couple of them uh, r- really kind of double click on this one and, and recognize this is an accusation. He is asking, I thought you were God. I thought your character was that you were all knowing that you were everlasting. And this is your plan. So he's, he's got a complaint and we're going to see it teased out here in a few moments, but he's saying, I don't get it. This, this doesn't sound like God to me. I thought that you were from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One. He's wrestling with who is God. If this is what God is saying to me, I bring up the evil in, our, in the people of God, and God says, I'm going to bring a worse people to be the instrument of my judgment. He says, I'm not sure who I'm talking to anymore. And, and what I want to say to us uh, is we wrestle with evil and injustice and the pain and the brokenness of our lives. This process that the prophet is going through of wrestling with God is actually a very, very healthy and helpful process where we're willing to say, God, I don't get it and I don't get you. And some of us are too fearful to be that honest and invited to do. God, I don't get what's going on here and I'm not really clear on who you are anymore. But I'm, wi- I'm willing to stay with us until you tell me. In fact, it reminds me of Uh, In the New Testament, when Jesus was giving this teaching in John chapter 6, it was very confusing. Uh, He's giving us a lecture, a sermon, and people are listening, and they're like, what is he talking about? And a bunch of them just leave, because it's a hard teaching, and it's, they're not comprehending it, and he's just, he keeps going on and on. And all, the whole crowd is departing. Then he turns, and he looks at the disciples, and he says, what about you guys? You guys going to leave? And they say, they have the honesty, and I'm paraphrasing big time, but they have the honesty to basically say, hey, we too don't understand a word of what you're saying. We don't get it. You, you have this teaching. It is bizarre. But we're not leaving because we believe that you have the words of eternal life. In other words, it's wrestling with God with the honesty and the audacity to say, God, I don't get it at all. Like, I don't understand what you're doing. I can't comprehend this thing. I know you told me I wouldn't, but I'm just being real with you. I don't get this, but I'm not leaving because you are God. And you have the answer to this thing, even if I can't currently perceive it. It's a wrestling with God, and that process, I would say, is very, very healthy. Most of us feel uh, fearful about doing that, but I think it's a good process to go through. In fact, I would say to to those of you that are young adults that have grown up within the church, the young adults that go through this and wrestle God and say, God, I don't get you anymore. I was told something about you, but you're not matching up to my expectations of you. The young adults that do that in prayer uh, with God, wrestle with God, they come out on the other side with a resilient faith, with a mature faith, with a confidence in God and in God's activity. But let's look at Habakkuk's complaints here. He feels uncertain. He feels, I would say, frustrated. And he's going to bring up his concerns. God, how can you, the holy God, use them, those impure vessels? How is that okay? Verse 13, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors? God, you cannot stand sin. You can't even look on it. And here you are co-opting these evil individuals into, into your purposes. How does that work? 
I don't get it. God, how can you possibly do that? Or how can you be silent about this? Look at verse 13, uh, halfway through it, and then uh, on to the end. He says, why do you idly look at the traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Habakkuk is saying, I went to Sunday school. I learned my Bible. In Leviticus chapter 5, we were told that, that if you had information as a witness, you were bound by law to testify to the evil. And here you are, God, and there's evil, and you're aware of it, and you're not saying anything. How does that work? He's being totally raw and totally honest with God. How can you, the Holy One, use unholy vessels? How can you observe all of the evil in these people and not say anything about it? These people are impetuous. You, God, have made us vulnerable. We're like fish. Look at verse 14. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. We're just kind of cruising around, and we, we're not sure what's going on. We're fish. We're vulnerable. But then he says, he, now he's going to talk about the, the Babylonian army in that singular he, he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net, like we were fishing at camp last week or a couple weeks ago now, and the kids would just, they'd catch fish, but it wasn't always in their mouth. They just had hooks, and there was a lot of fish, and they just, yank them out and they'd get hooked they'd hook whatever and it's saying so people are vulnerable and you've got this enemy and he's just hooking us and he's just dragging us out with his net and while he's doing it he's committing idolatry and worshiping his own instruments look at verses 15 and 16 he gathers them in his dragnet so he rejoices and is glad he's capturing them and he's excited about it he's he's reveling in it he's like this is amazing look at what i'm doing and he sacrifices to his net and makes off to his dragnet. He's worshiping the instruments of evil. He's capturing people, and he's rejoicing in the fact that he's doing this, for by these instruments he lives in luxury and his food is rich. This is a proud nation bent on evil, and it is merciless. Verse 17, Habakkuk is asking the question, is he then to keep this up? Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? God, if this is your plan, I don't get it. Is this just gonna ha- is, is this just gonna be how it is? You're gonna allow these awful individuals to come in and have their way, and is that the plan? So how is he feeling? I think we can answer that pretty straightforwardly. He is very confused and frustrated and possibly even mad at God. God doesn't seem to be playing by his own rules. God seems to be behaving in a way that is out of step with his own character. And what what Habakkuk is doing then is he is wrestling with the answer that God has given him. But he's wrestling with God. And so as we consider why this is important for us, we need to recognize a a few different things. The, The first thing that I would say is that when you are upset with God and you do not understand his ways and you look at providence in your life and you stack it all up and you add it up and you go this doesn't add up how can you a good god have allowed this to occur when you do that here's my first uh, pastoral encouragement stay with god wrestle with god be willing to just be completely honest with him and articulate how you how you are really feeling he can handle it he can handle it and in fact your your doubt um it doesn't necessarily mean there's an absence of faith. And in fact, in some ways, I would say it's, it's an evidence of your relationship with God. If you're willing to speak these things out to God and express your frustration and your concern, really it's proof that you're in a relationship with a living God who surprises you, who doesn't do everything the way they would do it. And when you wrestle with him in this way, it's a good and beautiful thing because you are coming to know God as he truly is. One of the commentators David Pryor, he puts it quite beautifully in his little commentary. He said that Habakkuk has this very strong inner security. He's a person beloved by God and belonging to God. And that then, because of his awareness of his relationship, he's able to do something that is quite bold. Uh, David Pryor puts it like this. "That, That confidence in his relationship releases him to batter the gates of heaven and berate the living God. Have you ever prayed like that, where you go before God with such honesty 
that you're willing to say, I don't get you. Are you sure you're God? Because you do not make sense to me. And then are you willing to stay with him until he answers? Because that's exactly what Habakkuk is doing here. He's like, I don't get you, but I'm not going anywhere. You're stuck with me. And I'm not, I'm not releasing you until you give me an answer here. And so he raises the second complaint, and we recognize that he is upset with God. And so here's the, the, one of the things I want you to recognize. The Bible really, really, really cares about your emotions. I'm not sure we just that enough. I'm speaking this week about all the discipleship material. Most of what we tell people within the church is you need to know some stuff and you need to do some stuff. There are certain truths that you need. You need to be aware of them. You need to affirm them. You need to believe those doctrines about God. And then you got to do some stuff. Here's the activity that Christians ought to perform. The Bible has a whole nother category, and it is the inner life of the believer. And it is significant that so much of the Bible is aimed in that direction. What's going on on the inside? You've got books like this one, like Habakkuk and Job and Lamentations that says, here's how you, here's how you unload your heart when life stinks. Here's how you unload your heart when nothing is going your way, when your life looks like a, like a smoking pile of, of rubble. Here's what it's like. The Bible says, you talk like this. You feel like this. The, the whole book of Psalms, it gives us all this language of the heart, of what it's like to follow an unpredictable God, a God that surprises us and doesn't do what we would anticipate in, in a world that's broken, that continues to assail us, and, and it gives us language because the inner life of the believer is a part of the discipleship program. And so we need to recognize what we feel is important to God. What's going on on the inside is important to God. And Habakkuk here, he feels an awful lot, but he is offloading it before God in prayer. Well, here's the thing that we need to see. What does this mean? Why is it that God sought to record this dialogue in a book of the Bible so that we would have it? What was he intending to accomplish here? What does he mean by it? What does he want us to take away from an experience like this? And I've got a handful of items here. The first is we need to be willing to say that God is at work and sometimes we don't understand it. God is at work doing stuff that maybe we can't perceive, but he's never inactive. He's, he never takes a break. He never checks himself out and says, you know what, I'm just going to step away for a little bit. We'll just see how this plays out. I'll return to it later. No, he's always at work. Sometimes we just don't discern it. Tim Keller points this out in his sermon on this, but I actually learned it in a missions course. It's interesting to think through how God used the Babylonians and other changes in world dominion in human history to accomplish the spreading of the gospel. It's wild. In a, in a missions course, one of the professors was talking through this like, isn't it wild that because of these different things, uh, the Jews were dispersed and they ended up in all these different places and they started doing worship a little different in synagogues? That would later be used in, in Christianity to be uh, an instrument of the gospel. Or these other things like Rome coming in and paving all these different places so people could travel. And we look at it on first pass and we go, yeah, that doesn't look good. It looks like God messed up here. But then you zoom out and you go, wait a minute. God was doing something that we would have never dreamt of. He was able to take some of these events in human history that we would write off as catastrophe, and he was able to repurpose them for his good purposes. Well, that's the second thing that I want you to see here, that there is this principle in Scripture that God can take evil and turn it to good. And it travels all the way through the entire Bible. God can take evil and he can turn it to good. I'm going to give you one example from the Bible to, to tease this one out. If you're familiar with the story of Joseph, I'm going to abbreviate it and just give you the highlights. But there was this young man born into a big family with a bunch of siblings, and he started to have some visions from God, and he started to share them. But in his immaturity and his lack of tact, he said it in a way that was so offensive to his entire family that they hated him. And the brothers devised a plan to get rid of him. We want this younger brother gone. And they were going to kill him. That was the plan. But then they saw an economic advantage of selling him into slavery. So they, they did that instead. But they took his outfit and they doused it in blood and brought it to the dad. 
that the dad thought he was torn by wild animals. So Joseph gets sold off into slavery, and he goes off, and the, the story follows him. And there's this pattern of the favor of God being on him, and so things get better. So he kind of gets elevated in every situation he's in. Favor of God is with him. It gets a little bit better, and then the wheels fall off. So in the first case, he gets a, a prominent position, but then somebody makes an advance against him and then accuses him of doing something he didn't do, and he gets thrown in prison. It's going really well for a moment, given the circumstances, but then it falls apart. Then he's in prison, and the same thing happens. The favor of God is on him. He, he gets uh, elevated in that prison, so he's, I don't know what that looks like. He's like the, the most important prisoner, and he's got all these responsibilities, and things are going kind of well for him, and then... Somebody comes in and he interprets a dream. And he says, hey, I'm in here. I didn't do anything. When you get out, why don't you tell the king about me and maybe I can be released? And the guy's like, yeah, that's a great idea. And then he gets released and he forgets. He doesn't say anything about Joseph. And Joseph is in prison for all of these different years. And, and it's just, it's, it's a depressing story. But eventually he gets released. And he gets in a position where because of God's favor on him and his ability to interpret what's going to happen. There's a season of plenty followed by a season of famine. And he tells the king, we need to make arrangements now with this season of plenty where we just stockpile a bunch of goods. And then when the famine comes, we'll be ready. And eventually that happens. And Joseph is second in command in all of Egypt and his brothers show up. His brothers show up because they've run out of food and they have to buy food from Joseph. And when they realized that the younger brother that they tried to kill and then they sold into slavery was in charge, they're like, we're dead. Like, I don't know if you've done anything awful to your sibling uh, and you're worried for your life. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been there before, but that's how they're feeling. They're like, he's going he's gonna to get his vengeance. Today's the day. And so they're trying to come up with all these different excuses and manipulate the circumstances. And Joseph looks at the history of God's providence. And he says this, this is actually Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He puts it like this, you intended to harm me. What you did, wrong, absolutely wrong. What you did is evil. That's how other versions put it. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. What you did was evil. God retooled it and used it for good, saving people. That's the principle that the brokenness in the world is something that God can take hold of and he can actually retool it to do something incredibly beautiful. Not dismissing the evil, not letting anyone off the hook, but he's able to take that where those people are morally responsible and culpable for those choices, but God is able to retool it and accomplish something beautiful. That principle travels all the way through the scriptures. And in fact, that is at the heart of the gospel. That's at the heart of the gospel. So when we get to the New Testament and we hear these people who are preaching the news of Jesus Christ and what he's done, they're able to say some pretty wild things. I'm going to show you Acts chapter 2. This is a sermon from the apostles, and this is what it, what it says. This man, Jesus Christ, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. What is he saying? He's preaching a sermon and he's going, there are some people who did very awful evil things. They handed Jesus the Christ over and they executed him. But what did God do? Even though that was an evil act, God was able to retool that for the sake of salvation. He was able to take what the disciples in the, in the first century at initial viewing of it, they thought that it's over. But God was able to work salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is God's ability to take what is evil and use it for good. Let me show you one more sermon. This is Acts 13 now. This is, this is actually the Apostle Paul preaching a sermon, and he cites Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5 the verse that we've looked at today. He uses it in his sermon. He's preaching a sermon. He goes, here's my text today, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. And he's telling the people, I want you to know salvation. I want you to know Jesus Christ. I want you to know that through Jesus, 
the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification that you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Okay, now he's going to quote Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, but he's explaining the good news of the gospel. Then he's leaning on Habakkuk to say, do not allow this to happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish. For I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. This is the good news of the gospel. It is so incomprehensible that we look at it and we can hardly believe it. And Paul is saying, be careful that you don't fall into the camp of unbelief who says, this is ridiculous. But instead, see this as the handiwork of God. That this is the MO of what God does. He's able to take the the execution of Jesus Christ, and it becomes for us salvation. Jesus was dying in our place and has been raised from the dead and lives at the right hand of God forevermore. So be careful to see this the right way. Be careful to look at it and recognize that God is taking the evil choices of wicked men and he's using it to bring salvation. That principle is a beautiful principle where God takes evil and he retools it for good. Okay, but we got one more thing to do because some of us are sitting here going, well, sounds good in theory, but have you seen my life? Right? Sounds good in theory, Core. I mean, yeah, great. God is bringing salvation to the earth, but my life, my life is so broken. I'm, what does it matter? What does it matter? Now, to know that God is able to take evil and repurpose it for good is one thing, but to believe it at the level of the heart is entirely different. There's a moment where Christians come to a place where they see the work of God so profoundly that it changes everything. That you can look at the circumstances of your life and they can all be going downhill and you can still rejoice in what God is up to. And here's what it is. It's when you begin to recognize that that work that happened on the cross, it started that day, but it is not finished. In the sense of this, one day he will return and make all things new. One day he will return and he will make all things new. He'll wipe away tears from eyes. There will be no more sin or sickness or pain or cancer. The old order of things is going away. Now, when that lands on your heart, it changes how you begin to interact with the broken world and your broken life. So the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, he puts it like this. He says, I've done the math here. I've added these things up and here's what I need to tell you. It is not even worth doing the math on this one. He puts it like this, Romans 8, 18. I consider, that's that mathematical term, I've done the math here, and, and they, they're not the same. So you start to do the debits on one side, and you go, my life is broken, this isn't working out, all these kind of negatives on one side. He goes, you can do that, but it's not even worth going down that road. It's just busy work. It's like the new kind of math that your kids do. It's like, man, there's a lot of extra stuff in here. He's like, you don't have to do that. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You want to know which one has more? If you're trying to weigh this one out and go, is it worth it? Is it worth it to follow this God who takes evil things and retools them for good? Is it worth it? And he goes, you don't have to do that math. You don't have to try to figure this one out. Like, ah, uh, maybe it's just bad. He goes, what the Lord is accomplishing far outweighs any suffering that we will ever go through in this world. And the Apostle Paul said that, but he also lived it. He was the dude who, by preaching the gospel, was arrested, and people tried to execute him. There was a time where they drug him out, they took rocks, and they stoned him to death, and they left him, thinking he was dead. And he gets up, like, I got work to do. I'm going to keep on preaching this Jesus Christ because my sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. The good news of the gospel, the fact that God can make all things new, that he could take evil and repurpose it for good, is such good news that it can change our lives. And we can cruise through a hurting and broken world with all kinds of disappointments, but when we come to this truth, when it lands on our heart, it changes us. And we join in the Apostle Paul rejoicing in our Lord and Savior and what he's done for us. Listen, God often speaks to us, and we don't fully get it. We can't always comprehend what he's up to. He told us as much. I'm going to explain it. You're not going to understand it. But he's at work, and his work is beautiful, and it includes the nations. 
We can feel all kinds of things about that, but let's take those honest feelings before the throne of God's grace and let's remember the cross work of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection for us. And that, my friends, will change us. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would help us to believe the good news of the gospel. We pray that you would give us perspective that helps us to see how you are at work in this world and and to be patient. Things didn't get better for Habakkuk. They got worse. Nonetheless, he came to a place of waiting in faith and rejoicing in trial. And I'm praying that for my church family. Obviously, Lord, I want things to get better. I'd love it if you would heal broken bodies, if you would heal broken marriages, if you would restore broken relationships. Lord, I would love all of that to happen, and I believe you have the power to do that. But no matter what, Lord, I pray that you would give us the faith that can wait patiently as you perform your glorious and wondrous work. And we look forward to the day where you return and you make all things right. But in the meantime, God, would you give us the spirit of being able to rejoice in the midst of suffering for your sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.